Hello, welcome to another ODNT Spotlight. I'm your host, Steve DeWinter, and I have with us a guest who has been with us before. She was part of a podcasting group called Myth Behaviors. And no, I did not have a slur there or a, whatever. It's a myth, as in epic myth. And so she is here with us. She just had a book release called Heart Stealer. And she is here to talk about that. So let's go ahead and switch on over. Hello, Katie. Welcome back to what? ODNT. I'm back. Thank you for having me back. Of course. Of course. Thank you for coming back. I, I so, feel like I should have my cohorts, but I, <laughs> I, know. I will do it myself this time. You feel naked and alone. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about Heart Stealer. <coughs> uh, sure. So it is a dark historical fantasy novel. Uh, following a young widow who's not actually convinced her husband is dead. He apparently died in mysteriously circumstances up in some northern backwater, so it's almost like a buddy cop film with magic. A buddy cop with magic, nice. Well, she goes up, she meets another girl, they start investigating, and then horrible magic and fey folk start appearing, so you know. (laughs) Magical Nancy Drew. (laughs) A a little older than that, let's go a little older than that. (laughs) Gets a little bit grim. Magical V.I. Wachowski. (laughs) Something like that. <laughs> yeah, I started to uh, read through some of the sample on Amazon, and I've got the link to the book Heart Stealer on Amazon down below, as well as the blurb from Amazon, so you can read it there, and then you can click the link and check it out. And it's pretty cool. You know, we start out with your main character there. She's been told her husband's been dead, but no body. What? It's like, no, I don't believe it now. And then we cut to them and was like, what? Yeah, it's a really interesting structure of like interweaving timelines. Uh, So there's the main one. There's one that's a little bit earlier. And then there's one that's very much earlier. So at one point, all three timelines will collapse into each other, I promise. Excellent. Uh, It it was a lot of fun to write, though, and to keep balancing. Okay, so this is happening right now. And this is what happened like two weeks ago. I like that kind of plotting. It pleases me. Yes. Well, I, I, I was able to keep up with Memento without a problem. That okay, old movie good. from like, what, 15 years ago now, I guess? or mm-hmm. It's been a while. Oh, I'm really old. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Let's, yeah, so you had multiple POVs mm-hmm. for this and multiple timelines for mm-hmm. this. And how, how, did you, how did you come about with the concept of, you know what, I'm not going to stick with a single POV or a single you know, POV character, or a single timeline. I'm just going to go ahead and go crazy with this. Honestly, it started because Pip Ballantyne in her novel Digital Magic did a similar thing, where there are two timelines that you thought were happening concurrently, but one was actually spoilers. Uh-oh, much, spoiler much, alert. I hope this book has spoilers. been out long enough, so it's Digital not our Magic's fault. Digital Magic's been out for like seven or eight years now. So if okay, you well, if you haven't read it yet, yet, it's your own damn fault. Exactly. Um, and then it turns out, oh, no, that one was happening much earlier. Um, so I wanted to, it started out as I wanted to see if I could pull off the same trick. And then it turned out that the story itself really needed to have that kind of uh, structure because the past and the history of the characters plays so much into what's happening in the present. You really do need to be seeing these things happening simultaneously. So we, we, we introduce more information of what happened in the past to make right now make more sense. Exactly. It adds that extra layer of meaning and context and illumination. And then vice versa, the stuff what's happening now, when you go back and you go, oh, I un- I understand the connection now. Excellent. Well, it's kind of like uh, that show Lost. A little bit. I didn't Where... actually get into Lost. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, they, they would sit there and they would show something that happened in the past that then made what the character did now make sense. Exactly. Yeah. I uh-huh. think I would like Lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in that respect, it's like Lost. Here in the States, we watched Lost religiously. We watched Lost in Canada, too. I'm just not cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it slowly devolved into it fit its name. Lost was more descriptive of the audience by the end of it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but it well, started out great. <laughs> hopefully, I will have stolen all of your hearts by the end of the novel. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, I was looking through the review on it for it, and you seem to have stolen somebody's heart. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that was uh, (laughs) Melissa Hayden, who does um, My World in Words and Pages. She's lovely. 
and writes really insightful reviews. Like, hey, Melissa, can you please do mine? <laughs> Read it over and tell me what you think. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. So, so Heartstealer, um, since this, now we know that this is a magical fantasy novel involved, are there any actual hearts being stolen? Or You'll just it... have to keep reading, won't oh, you? I have to keep reading. <laughs> so is this a standalone novel from you or is there I going could... to be more? I could be convinced. Um, I certainly, yeah, as I often do when writing novels, I left the ending, it could wrap up there, but I certainly left enough threads to keep going. Um, And I've certainly, the people who have come back to me with feedback after it's been out seem to be clamoring for a sequel. Yeah, whenever Uh, we find something we truly love, we want more of that. Yeah, I think, I think the characters definitely have more arc to get through. There's two or three in particular that I know where they would be going. Um, there are a few novels I want to get through first. So like we have would have things... to wait for a sequel to oh. Heart Stealer. Well, kind of looking at my spring and fall, there's one I want to have done by, say, late March. So maybe this time next year, a sequel for Heart Stealer could come out, theoretically. Excellent, excellent. So tell us a little bit about the main character or characters, characters? for Heart Stealer. Uh, so our main character is Sarah. She is our, our young widow. She's lovely because she's really neurotic. <laughs> and, <laughs> Always makes for a good character. I'm not neurotic at all. No, she's very, very bright. Um, but she's definitely a, a fish out of water in a lot of ways because she's lived this kind of life uh, as an academic's wife in the city. Um, and now she's completely thrust out of her element in this backwater country town. Doesn't know anyone trying to sort out what's happened to her husband. There's also uh, her nephew who's involved and she needs to sort out care for him. She's like in no fit state to be taking on that kind of responsibility. <laughs> um, all well, of she's the just been told her husband's dead. She won't exactly. accept it. And she, she has ex- the responsibility. What? Exactly. And she's relatively young, right? Like she's only in her, her early 20s. She gets there. All these like myths and legends she thought was just quaint folklore <laughs> turns out to not be. Um, And she does have this very analytical brain. So with her, I feel like she's constantly trying to reconcile what she's seeing in terms of the folklore and the fae and the wraiths and the ghosts appearing versus how she's been trained as an academic. Right, of what's real and what's not. And she's already decided the science world is the real world. Yeah, it's that scientific mindset for sure. So she's like the perfect person to find out what's happened for a murder. When you start throwing in the ghosts and, and the fae, she needs a little bit of backup. <laughs> <laughs> so there's her weakness. <laughs> yes. Luckily, she does meet uh, a girl there, Mary, uh, who's a local village woman who takes a shine to her, who's a very different personality. She's grown up with all of the legends and the folklore and everything, so she's used to that. She's also a bit flighty. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, the buddy cop kind of thing, right? So the two of them team up and their strengths really complement each other as they're trying to sort out what's happening with the Fae and the Wraiths crossing into our world. That's a bad thing. And also what happened to the <laughs> husband. As she tries to solve the crime, if there is a crime or are they just covering up something else or, oh my goodness, you have to read it. These, these little villages have a lot of very dark secrets. <laughs> <laughs> that they do. That they do, and that that should be the tagline for your book. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. These yeah. little villages have very big secrets. Well, big maybe that could secrets. be. I think that's a tagline for a sequel. There it is. Yes. <laughs> so, like what was it. your inspiration for writing Heart Stealer? Oh man. Okay. So I work at a living history museum in Toronto, right? So we've got like I think it's thirty buildings on a forty-acre site all from the 19th century, and I loved it. And all my friends are there, and it's great. Then I went to New Zealand and Australia for six months, and I really missed it. Oh, no. In fact, you might say that my, my little village museum had had stolen my heart. Oh. Ah, ah. Um, <laughs> so it is very much my love song to my village and my museum. And um, the 19th century is a, an era I'm very, very comfortable in. Um, so it's a love song called The History I've Done as well. As, but I feel like when I look at my novels and I try to trace where exactly things came from, it's usually like dryer lint. Things just stick together <laughs> from all sorts of different sources. So definitely the setting love song in terms of the, so the darkness and the wraiths and the folklore, that's always been an interest of mine. And those are cool. So, 
yeah, so it's just marrying two things that I really, really liked. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And going back to the cover, let me switch over to the other screen here. Actually, I can bring it over on top of us. Too. Oh, and there it is. You're holding the book up. So, and there's the cover right there. That is such, such a I, cool cover. I love it. Um, this is a Starla Hutchton cover. Uh, Starla is an author and a graphic designer. And as you can see, she does very good work. Yeah, amazingly good work. I'm yes. jealous. Oh, my that's, mom. That's been a huge thing, basically, since the cover was revealed of people really, really liking the cover. I don't blame them. I really like the cover. Yeah. It is just like, it's just amazing. It's perfect. And it's cool, too. I really love the fact that Sarah's cloak ended up on the cover. Because in my head, that's actually my cloak ah. that I wear. Ah, I put it in the story because it's my favorite piece of clothing that I own at the museum. And that's not the actual one. But in my head, it's close enough. So. <laughs> that's what it feels like when you wear it. Yeah, I feel super badass and like mysterious with woods behind me and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Very, it's very cool. Taste. So what's your process for when you're sitting down to write? Are you someone who likes to outline heavily? Because you, you're doing historical information on this. So it's a historical fantasy novel. Yeah, so it's basically 19th century Ireland and everything but name. It is a secondary world, but basically it's analogous to our own 19th century. Um, I'm the kind of person who likes to have a loose outline, so I don't break things down chapter by chapter, scene by scene, but I have at least, at least a pretty good bullet list of points that I'm going to hit. So I very rarely will just sit down without any idea and start typing. I like to have some kind of structure. You like um, to know where the next... Uh... Checkpoint I like to in. know the next, the next landmark, but if there's a really cool detour that's gone somewhere else, I've got enough flexibility to follow that rabbit for a bit. Exactly. And then, then you know where you can get right back on track. Exactly. Like, I have that backbone. So even if we make some digressions along the way, I can still follow my main arc. I really... It's, I'm also a playwright by training, and when you're writing plays especially, that architecture is so very important of breaking down the story into acts and then figuring out where certain turning points are. And if you apply the formula to plays, films, books, you'd be surprised at just how often it holds true because it works. Right, and how often we see it when we actually are finally looking for it. Exactly, and how sometimes when a story feels right, you know, like it's something that we kind of sense at the gut level of, yes, this is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then you apply the skeleton of, play structure on top of it. It fits really, really well. <laughs> so you've also done screenplays and... Uh, uh, stage well, not, plays. Not movie screenplays, but uh, stage. Yes, stage, yeah. Um, I've had a few plays produced, not mostly when I was a bit younger. Um, although I do write uh, for the museum sometimes stage plays. And I wrote an opera, actually, like last year. Woo. Was it last year? Last year or the year before, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so you've taken that, the skill of a stage play where you have the points and the, the actual structure, because you're, you're saying we want to run this in a specific time slot too, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've taken that and used that to say, here's, here's how a good story can be told. Well, stories are stories are stories, right? So right. a similar structure for a play will often work for a novel, not all the time. Um, but three-act structure, I'm pretty sure novelists learn that, short story writers learn that. I think it's partly how you execute it and on what scale you execute it that will make a big difference. Exactly. Um, so uh, when you were writing out Heart Stealer, mm -hmm. how much of uh, you did you put into any of the characters? I feel like, much like actors, all characters are partly you. Um, they have to be, because you have to find something within yourself if they're going to live. Um, so, uh, people see certain parallels. Um, <laughs> the cloak. The cloak, <laughs> the slight neuroticism, <laughs> and analytic nature. Um, yeah, there's actually no, but there's one character that I did not put myself into. I, I borrowed our brewmaster from Black Creek. <laughs> Ah. I didn't I didn't try to hide that. It's just it's him dropped in. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So what's uh so right now you you said you will be you could be in 
pushed into writing a sequel <laughs> to this, but what, what's next for you? Oh, man. Um, so I have a few things to finish up for the museum before the end of the year. Um, I've got a novel in a, a completely separate world, something else, that I'm trying to get done kind of by late March, early April. Um, about the same time that I'll have another fairly large writing thing for the museum. Um, then potential Heart Stealer sequel. Oh. Um, I think, I don't know how much of this I can talk about, but you might have seen on the internet that Ed Greenwood of the Forgotten Realms uh -huh. has a cool collaborative thing that he's doing wherein he's got a number of worlds that he's created and he's getting creatives to write short stories and novels um, and other sorts of creative endeavors. I think there's some where you can do like music, say, or audio dramas. Right. Um, so the first one, Helma's coming out on Halloween, the first world. Oh, nice. Um, and then there's a few others that are going to be announced throughout November. Let's just say that I'm in two. Ooh. And I'm writing more than one novel. Oh. Very nice, very nice. So what's coming out? Are these audio dramas coming out? They might eventually be turned into audio dramas, I guess, but they will be novels. No, oh, okay, great. So that's, Excellent. I think all of that's going to keep me very busy. Yes, it sounds like your schedule is packed. <laughs> oh, well, I, I like to keep busy. It's, it's always good to be doing something. I think, and especially if you can be very diverse and very versatile in what you're doing. Right. Um, well, and so it's not just novels. Yep, yeah, the diversity. Uh, we, we talked earlier about uh, possibly mentioning podcasting. Yes. As well, so on top of all this writing that we just got done talking about, there's other things you do. Yeah, I have a podcast. It was a nine-part audio drama called Coxwood History Fun Park. <laughs> it was a very different love song. <laughs> it, I show affection for things by mocking them sometimes. <laughs> Uh-oh, I hope you don't like me. <laughs> I, I only said sometimes, sometimes. Um, so that was basically, it's the podcast I wanted to do for my museum if they'd let me. And if all of the terrible, horrible things I claim happened actually did. So <laughs> once again, there's ghosts. There's a goblin that lives under the stairs. It's like Night Vale meets <laughs> a museum run by Stephen King. Oh, um, man. Paul Ellis, my, my myth-behaving comrade, uh -huh. voices uh, a murderous groundhog. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I do that. I also have um, a one-woman audio drama that I'm actually trying to get funding for from the Ontario Arts Council. Oh. Yeah, because it's centered, you can see where my mind goes, it's centered around Canadian folklore. Oh, um, neat. Yeah, and I'm Canadian, and my voice actress is Canadian. So, hello. So, I would oh, like Canada, some Canadian, look, look, pay uh, come attention. on, government, I would like some Canadian money. <laughs> right. Uh, so that one was pretty cool. I took uh, five traditional Canadian stories and strung them together into a narrative and then it had a framing narrative around it. Ah, so they're all linked. They're all linked, exactly. And then uh, the last story is an original fairy tale um, that, much like Heart Stealer, where the jumping back and forth through timelines makes everything make sense somehow in the end. <laughs> the more we mix it up, the more it makes sense. Yeah. Clearly, my mind is a very strange place, but that's okay. Well, you're leading us on a journey of discovery. I, I like playing with the reader, I think, is what it comes down to. I've actually just been reading a lot of Agatha Christie oh. lately, and she is the best-selling author after the Bible and Shakespeare for a reason, which is that she totally plays with the reader the yeah. whole time, the entire book. And I, I really like the way she plots because she's setting up these structures very carefully and very deliberately. And I've read enough of her to know, like, if she makes a mention of something, okay, that's significant. I don't know how, <laughs> but I, I see what you did there. Shall we, shall we dance, Agatha? Shall we dance? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it's a meeting of the minds as you compete. Can I oh, figure I, out before oh, you tell me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that kind of really tricky, but also very playful way of plotting and despite the fact that she writes about murder, actually I write about murders too, um, you know, the, the subject matter I think can be quite dark, but the intention and the way you go about plotting that kind of story, I think it is very playful. So on the one hand, I, I do want to mess with the reader's head a little bit and I want to have that sleight of hand and misdirection. 
because I'm a terrible person and it brings me joy. <laughs> <laughs> the schadenfreude, joy from the misery of others. Yes. <laughs> I don't want to make you miserable. I just want to go, ha, I made you think one thing, but actually it was this. Ha ha. <laughs> and when you go back now and look, you will see what I did. <laughs> <laughs> so on a second reading of Heart Stealer, you go, of course, of course. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. I don't think anyone's read it twice in the like two weeks it's been out. Yeah, it's, it's pretty new. It's pretty new. It's pretty new. But the, if anyone would like to read it twice and get back to me, I, I'll i buy you a beer or something. Oh, there you mm. go. So I've got the link for uh, Heart Stealer on Amazon just down below. If you're watching this uh, embedded on another website, click the little button over there that says watch on YouTube and then you can see all the description down below. And I've got the Amazon link, as well as you can connect with uh, KT. I've got her website, her Facebook, her Twitter, so that oh you my. can stalk mm. KT and get that beer from her. <laughs> yes, I'm. I I am good with beer. I'm I'm a beer expert according to my job description. So. <laughs> it's in the job description now. It is. But actually, you laugh, but it is. And I've also got the links to all your other books on Amazon. So, and you've done some books yourself. You've done some books with other authors mm -hmm. and everything. I did so, indie presses. Yeah, I'm all over. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Just writing, writing, writing. There's a writing. joke I could. I'm, I'm a writing something. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. So. I've pretty much hit all the questions I had about Heart Stealer and other stuff. Is there anything else before we uh, close down the interview that you would like the people watching or potential readers of Heart Stealer to know? Hmm. Well, I would like you all to buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's oh, and and if you do, and if well, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. If you could leave a review, though, that would be cool. There you go. Amazon, yes, on Goodreads. Um, as usual, I will plug uh, Tales of the Tesla Ranger which is probably in your links, but that is the charity anthology that I was in last year, uh, still still collecting money for PG Holyfield's children. Oh, right, right. So I will, I will, I will add that link. I didn't have it in there now. I have it from the previous video, but I can add that in for you, the Tales of a Tesla Ranger. Yes, I will just keep plugging that. <laughs> yes, I will, I will add that link before I upload this to YouTube. Huzzah! All right. Well, hey, thank you so very much, Katie, for agreeing to come back onto ODNT. You suffered through one time with me, and you got it again. Thank you so much for inviting me back. I had so much fun the first time. I wanted to chat with you again. Yeah, exactly. I wanted you all to myself. Forget me. Like, yeah, those exactly. Folks. Not those other people getting in the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and by all means, any future books you have as they come out, or we'll get podcasts. you back on. Folklore Canadian podcast. Oh yeah! Ooh. Hey, you know it would be cool if we got my um, actress on too, my collaborator. Hey, that would be fun. Yeah, I'm now. I'm just touring her out to all the podcasters. Well, let's do that. <laughs> all let's right, that let's up. bring. So let's everyone bring watching you this, have, you can have two Canadians for the price of one. Hey, hey, excellent! I like that exchange rate. <laughs> That's actually about what the exchange rate is right now. It's really sad. <laughs> I like when Americans give me money right now. I don't like paying Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get you both on here and we'll we'll talk about your podcasts. Woot. Let's hope we get funding. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Well well we'll use this to gain awareness for it so that people can then well then you will get the funding. Yes. I, I will send this to the Ontario Arts Council. That'll exactly. be a thing. Exactly. That'll be the way to do it. In my head they've got like cloaks. And they're at a table with candles on it and like a skull in the center. <laughs> and they are the council. They decide the fate of others. With like a beaver and a moose in the background because they're the <laughs> Ontario council. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, hey, thank you so very much for coming on, Katie. Don't, don't hang up just yet. Uh, okay. we'll, I'll just close down the interview and we'll come back. We'll chat for a couple more minutes. Cool. But thanks again for coming back on ODNT and having the spotlight shined back on you. Thanks so much. All right. See so that was KT Brisky and her new novel, Heart Stealer, has only been out for a couple of weeks. So definitely check the links down below and click on that. Check out the preview. I guarantee you when you read that preview, you're going to want to know more. I mean, she just starts to layer in the questions and the mystery. And it's just like, okay, I want to know more. And just looking at that cover tells you what kind of story you're in for. A very fun, exciting, wild ride and a good mystery. 
All right, once again, I'm Steve DeWinter for ODNT Spotlight. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. I have many more interviews coming up. In fact, I've got one uh, that will most likely be scheduled soon with a great Canadian podcaster and one of the actors in it. And so <laughs> be sure to sign up for ODNT Spotlight here on YouTube and have yourself a great night. Bye.